I would like to uh, mention the three poetry books that you published. Uh, the first one, I believe, was Madonna Anno Domini, which was published by Louisiana State University Press in 1997, and for which you received the Walt Whitman Award. Uh, and it was then followed by The Totality for Kids, which was published by UCAL in 2006. And then, most recently, Red Epic, uh, which was published by Commune Editions in um, 2015. And um, I would also like to mention that after um, completing a BA at Boston University, you got an MFA uh, degree from the Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, there has been a style that has developed uh, you know, from creative writing workshops um, and your work is completely different from that style. Um, what was your experience at the um, in Iowa, and, and is that is that I mean, do you have a vision of what creative writing departments are doing, uh, or a conception of what creative writing departments are doing today in the U.S.? I have a two probably two visions of that one positive and one negative. So this is I mean this is a useful question for me since it's very hard to understand how your look your work appears from the outside and so it's useful to sort of hear this from the outside. I think when I was accepted to the IO Writers program, which was in 1989, uh, 1988, uh, my work probably did comport reasonably closely with their aesthetic tradition. Their aesthetic tradition has not been perfectly stable, but you and I both know what it means to say there's an Iowa style, and uh, I think at the time I went there, probably the most orienting figure aesthetically was someone like Charles Wright. Maybe it's somewhat different now, but uh, someone described it as sentimental realism. That seems a little harsh, but, um, but I, I know what that means. Uh, and I think when I was accepted, I was not too far from that. But the, the thing about me, for better or worse, is that I'm just a very negative person, um, and always have been. So, I mean, one useful example I always talk about is when I first applied to college, so undergraduate, you have to write an essay, you know, and they said, uh, invent a new word, explain what it means, explain how it would come into common usage. And I wrote seven pages about why that was a stupid question. Um, and unanswerable the way they formulated it, and and, uh, and of course it worked, right? I, that was a bad lesson. I got into college, and I said, oh, this works if you just sort of disagree with people. Uh, that was probably a terrible lesson to learn. <laughs> so my experience of Iowa was I went there. It's a very large program, as, as, as some people will know. There's 50 poets, undergraduate poets, at any given time. And for me, it was a great experience of what I didn't want to do. I saw a lot of aesthetic commonality, as you say. I didn't think it was very interesting. And so, on the one hand, I was very well taken care of there. I do not want to speak well of the program. They were, they were good to me. They supported me. They gave me work. They gave me money. They let me walk around town saying, I'm a poet, and no one laughed at me. Uh, these are important things. They really are. Uh, but aesthetically, there was very little there happening that I thought, oh, that's what I want to do. So I hadn't yet figured out I don't know if I've still fig not yet figured out what kind of poet I wanted to be, but I knew what I didn't want to be from Iowa. So I came away from there already swerving away. And I think that swerve has continued. So the first book is maybe not that far from the Iowa aesthetic. I think it's, it's pretty, for better or worse. Uh, um, but by the third book, by Red Epic, quite some time later, yeah, I agree, it's very far. Uh, and I read many different poets in that period, uh, many of whom were not traditional workshop poets, and it really changed my style. Right now, I'm not sure what writing workshops should be doing. We've passed peak MFA, as we say in the United States. There was this, you know, swift and ongoing expansion in the number of writers' workshops from the 70s and 80s into the 90s and the zeros, and we seem to have passed the peak. It's starting to contract a little bit, we're seeing fewer applications, and that I think raises all these questions of what some workshops are competing for students by being more cross-genre, intermedia, 
which is sort of a way of saying you can do anything you want. If you seem interesting, come here. I think all workshops can do is give people money and provide an umbrella. You know, the world is rain, and the best a workshop can do is say, we'll be your umbrella for two years, and we won't get in your way. Mm -hmm. This is all. I, I teach, obviously, uh, one class a year, and in the, in the, we have a writing program at the University of California, Davis. I teach scholarly classes, but I teach one class a year for graduate creative writing poets. And I don't think I teach them very much. I say, my task is to make sure you write as many poems as possible. Um, let's not worry too much about the details, let's not get too fussy, let's not polish every uh, corner, let's just write. Uh, and this is maybe the best we can do. How do you do that? I mean, how do you uh, ask your students to do some reading? Uh, do you suggest uh, some various poetic traditions that they can tap into? I do. I, do. That, that I tend to do individually, which is to say rarely do I go into a class of, let's say I have seven students or nine students, and rarely do I say like, oh, it's very important that we should all read the Black Mountain Poets here. You look at their poems, you, you've seen them of course before they ever arrive, you look at their poems, you have meetings with them, and you think like, oh, maybe it would be interesting to them to read this poet, and you pull it off the shelf. It's a small program, so it's useful to be individualized that way. The reading that we share, I tend to set sort of conceptual problems, like I'll decide realism. What is it? How do we understand it as poets? Uh, what's our orientation to it? Might that change us? And so we'll read books about realism, but importantly from my pedagogy, never about poetic realism. I, f I find, to be honest, and I understand this because I do it myself, students can get very defensive if they feel like they're reading a critique of workshops. Right. And there's many critiques of workshops in the world, as you know. So if you say, like, here's many doubts, that have, they get very defensive. So instead, I just say, here's a book about realism and painting. Um, what's this relationship to your poetry? Uh, two years ago, we read the novel The Savage Detectives by Roberto Bolaño. I, I like that novel, I think it's an interesting novel, but it's about poets, right? Um, but it's a novel about poets, so they don't get to, and about sort of poetic communities, and they can engage that without feeling directly challenged. We often read uh, the workshop era, the program era, that's what it's called, by Mark McGurl, which is a history of writing workshops, but a history of fiction workshops. So they can start to think through the problems, the limits, the histories of how creative writing enters into the institution and becomes enclosed in it without it being about poetry. Mm -hmm. And so that, I think, leaves a little bit more space to, uh, for them to think. And then in terms of what poems I give them, well, honestly, it's, it's funny. I think there's been a historical reversal. I think it used to be the case, I might be guessing, I might be making this up, I don't know. I think it used to be the case. It was the case with me. When I went to graduate school, I actually knew the tradition fairly well. I had a good education. My parents were both academics. There were books around. So I knew Anglophone modernism pretty well, um, and, and Whitman and Dickinson, and I, I was very committed to Wallace Stevens and like this. But I don't think I'd read any poetry written after 1970. When I, went to, when, I, when I went to graduate school, uh, so Jory Graham called up and said, oh, we've accepted you, and I didn't know who Jory Graham was, which I thought she was perhaps a secretary. <laughs> um, and, uh, so I, and, and so for me, what, got, what I got was a lot of contemporary poetry. Now it's a bit reversed. Students, I think, know the tradition a little bit less well. I don't blame them, I largely blame the decline in college education, high school, especially high school education, no one reads poetry anymore. Uh, but they know contemporary poetry often through internet magazines and, and communities they have. So I find myself doing more of like, you think you know Gertrude Stein, but you probably haven't read a lot of Gertrude Stein. Here, you know, who's making of Americans? Um, or, you know, spend the weekend reading this. Uh, or, or Wallace Stevens. Uh, I discovered in my workshop last year that nobody in the room had much familiarity with Wallace Stevens, one or two poems. Which you know, my my uh, that broke my heart, my 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 deep love for Wallace Stevens. So I just you know gave them all Wallace Stevens books, and they were pretty excited. What what um, which brings us back to your poetry? Um, 
And so you said that you know when you uh, went to graduate school, you basically had read the uh, modernist tradition up to the 1970s. Um, what poets were more, m most important for your early work, uh, I mean, for your first books? Um, Ashbury, most of all. I mean, you know, so again, I think that the poets I read a lot of when I was a teenager, they get into your bones, they're like radiation, and so they're always, always there, so that, that would include Robert Frost, who of course everybody now claims to hate, and I understand why, but I read a lot of Robert Frost when I was 13 years old, and it's part of me. And Wallace Stevens, William Carlos Williams, Dylan Thomas, Elizabeth Bishop, they were all already inside me. I don't, but I needed something else to happen beyond that. And it was my encounter with Ashbery, who I encountered first as an undergraduate and rejected because I felt too much, uh, I was too much a modernist as, a, as an undergraduate. And I took a great class in the lyric, uh, and I was, we were given self-portrait and convex mirror, and I just rejected it. I was like, no, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, charlatanry. Um, and you know, three years later, I, I, I sang quite a different song and, and, and went through a deep, deep romance with Ashbury, where I really experienced him as the greatest artist I'd ever encountered. And, uh -huh. and in the 90s, reading from you know, the first five books and then A Wave, I think is a really important book for me. Uh, that, I think, deeply and probably too much influenced uh, my first book. But certainly since then, very different things have happened. So the most recent book, I would say the biggest influence is Diane de Prima, who you know could not be a contemporary of Ashbery's in some sense, uh, right. but could not be further aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm still changing. I hope. Right, and and well, speaking of change, um, how do you think or how do you see your work evolving from the first uh, from? Um, uh, Madonna and the Domini to uh, the Totality Focus to Red Epic and, and, and what writers, if any, were, you know, what readings were important for you in that, in that uh, process? I never tried to systematize that. I would say, actually, to, to sort of generalize about that sequence, Yeah, for the first book, Ashbery, and what I would generally call the postmodern aesthetic, which I mean very specifically, which is to say not just postmodernism, it's an aesthetic, but a sort of aesthetic version of postmodernism. Right. Um, the postmodernism that still has interest in the beauty of the line, the intentional ugliness of the line, but a lot of thought about the, the aesthetic characteristic. The totality for kids, I would it would be very hard to say there were certain poets that got, got me there. What, what got me from the first book to the second book was a lot, I traveled a lot for the first time, including a lot of, a lot of that book was written living in Paris. Uh, mm -hmm. But I traveled a lot for the first time, but also I started to read a lot of uh, modern contemporary political theorists and philosophers mm -hmm. for the first time. I didn't get a PhD, so uh, I've managed to, on sort of working on my own, catch up as best I can with my scholarly friends who have these great educations, and I've sort of had to reach to catch up. And in that period leading up to the, the second book, I was reading a huge amount of Frankfurt School, Benjamin, Adorno, mm -hmm. uh, but also other uh, sort, of, sort of contemporary theorists, and I think they influenced the book quite a bit. Um, it's funny because there have been some complaints that the first book even was too egg-headed or scholarly or something like that. That's the joke. The second book, Totality of Kids, has a, an index in the, in, the, in the back. On the one hand, that's a bit of an homage to Stephen Rotifer. Not the only person to ever have an index, but um, one of my favorite Rotifer books has an index, and, mm -hmm. and um, I love Rotifer's poetry. He, he himself was a difficult person, as we all know, but I love I loved his a lot of his poetry. So it's an homage to him, but it's also sort of just a fuck you to the people who are like, this book has, the first book, has too many references, too scholarly, and I was like, well, I'll show you my references, I'll show you my scholarship, and, and uh, so I think that was a big influence on the, on the second book. And the third book, I can name the poet, certainly, I, you know, I mentioned De Prima, and certainly I would say uh, other poets of that, of that uh, moment, Baraka, 
I'm, I'm never not influenced by Apollinaire, who I probably should have named all along, alongside mm -hmm. St Stevens, and he's been influential on me in different ways at different times, but I think he remains throughout all three books. But the other thing that changes the third book is that all my friends and I go through this fairly intense political moment in the Bay Area around 2008, 2009, 2010, all kinds of very dramatic struggles in the university, uh, lots of people going to jail, lots of people um, involved in street fights with the police. Uh, it opens up into Occupy Oakland in 2011, which in Oakland was a bizarre political phenomenon, not least because it was filled with poets. So a lot of the central organizers and people who were there every day, there were poetry readings on the plaza every day, but then there was also poets doing non-poetry things, doing political work, and uh, uh, so those two, I think, trajectories of Bay Area poetry, which is a great tradition, of course, multiple traditions, and uh, direct political struggle just uh, had a tremendous confluence around 2011. And that changed everyone's poetry. You know, I could talk about how it changed me, but obviously it changed, you know, Juliana Spar, who I know you know, my, um, you know, probably my closest friend, and it transformed her poetry, and, and we started a press along with our, our friend Jasper out of that moment, and, and I think, but I think there's 30 or 40 poets in the Bay Area whose poetry just really went through dramatic changes in that period. So it's not just what poets I read. I know, I understand why that's a good question, but I think more about the moments we pass through and the experiences that I share with my friends and colleagues. Right, right. Um, in a poem ending with a line from Niederker, since you were talking about poetry and politics, mm -hmm. um, uh, is, is there a form of melancholy about um, the uh, power of poetry to change things? Um, I could quote from the poem, but uh, there's a moment when you say, well, no one's going to be arresting you. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry for paraphrasing, but no one's going to be arresting you for your poetry. Uh, and there seems to be a constant ongoing uh, reflection in your poems. Um, from Red Epic on, on the uh, uh, immediate social and political effect of, of poetry. Yeah. And there seems to, uh, in that particular poem, be a form of melancholy arising from this. That's, that's absolutely true, and that's central. It's a bit of an irony or a paradox or something that the, often the more sort of aesthetically attuned poetry is, the more it seems self-confident that it's also part of some transformational project. So my first book, I, I still believed at that time that poetry was part of a, uh, a larger political project that changed the world, um, that has a great historical grammar. Right? Modernism really believed, modernism really believed it was part of a world-making project that wasn't just aesthetic, but involved the kinds of dramatic transformations of society that we saw in the early 20th century. Uh, and as, as, as my own poetry has become more explicitly political, it's become less persuaded by the idea that it itself is an important part of political change or something, or something like that. So this contradiction, I think, gives, exactly gives forth the melancholy you're talking about. Of, you know, earlier in that sequence, the, the, the firestorm, when I think it says, right, that um, you know that the most poetry is not the le the best poetry is not the least revolution, right? But you also know that poetry is the best way you have of affirming this fact, right? So it's an important thing to say that oh, you can't just sit at home and write poetry and think you'll change the world, but that needs to be said, and poetry is a quite good way to say that. So that's right. so the melancholy is there absolutely, and to be honest, I think that melancholy was always there in different forms, which is to say, the totality for kids, for example, I think is, it has a strange politics, which is to say, it's really interested in the beauty of what some people call late capitalism. You know, it's not the simple sort of like, ah, capitalism is terrible, it's destroying us all. There's, there's versions of that I sometimes find them interesting, but it sort of has this melancholic um, 
this force that arose in history and has persisted for two or three centuries has produced the most astonishing, beautiful, moving um, monuments to civilization we've ever encountered, and it still has to go. And that melancholy has always been with me, of wanting to, uh, to, to admit that walking through the streets of Paris, where we are now, I'm a sucker. I think it's beautiful. I find it moving. But I also know that it's a remnant of exactly the development that we need to overcome. And I don't want to be dishonest and say, like, I see through Paris. Paris is a hoax. Uh, so that contradiction between recognizing the beauty and the power of that civilization and wanting to see it destroyed and burned to the ground, I think that traps you, right? That contradiction um, sort of fixes you in place, and that feeling of being fixed in place is the melancholy that you're naming. Right. And there is a passage in... Um uh, let's see, in uh, Fragments on the Machine, uh, where I think uh, you say this, um, uh, where, uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, Fragments on the Machine is actually just the French, the name for a little a collection of three poems that Abigail translated with me. Right. It's not an actual poem itself, so that includes oh, right. the long poem, Years of Analysis for Day of Synthesis, and then right. I forget what else is in there. Spring well, the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age, right, and, exactly. Which is a really great poem in which there's this uh, long paragraph where you say, um, and so you're walking in Paris, and you say, um, and you talk about the uh, zone, and then you s the, the paragraph ends, and you say, I, I, and I want to be honest about uh, how much I love this, all of this, and its pleasure is my pleasure, and its wine is my wine, when I can afford it, and I am holding this in mind as truth and measure, when I say it must be annihilated, not as text, but really now. Um, and it, it just, first of all, I thought this, the entire uh, stanza or paragraph was, was really beautiful. And, and also very strong in, in its um, uh, political and literary um, reflection. Uh, and it, the, the, the word which you just said, which is very important to me, is honesty there. And it reminded me of um, O'Hara's, you know, I'm ashamed of, of my century, but I have to smile. Um, yeah. And I don't know if it's yeah. an obvious connection there, but um, you know, you, Apollina, yeah. and then O'Hara's um, surface. O'Hara is O'Hara is always there, and of, of course, when I talk about the melancholy of feeling uh, an ambiguous attraction for and um, desire to destroy the beauty of the world, I think O'Hara is always sort of present in that. There's there's no great there's no greater sort of account maker of the power of that monument, which is the modern city itself, right? And, and he's, he's been quite an important poet for me now, even more so. You know, there was this period where I would have argued and said, oh, Ashbery is a greater poet. I forget what my argument would have been, but I, I, I abandon that now. I'm back to where I started, which is thinking that O'Hara is, for me, uh, more powerful. Interestingly, that passage you read I remember exactly what poet I was reading when I was writing that passage, and it was Le Traitement, mm. um, who, in his sort of combination of miasmatic production of imagery that makes it hard to look at yourself, but also the sense of an absolute, like the absolute demand, you know, there's only one kind of poetry that's in that poem, I stole that from him. Mm. Uh, and. Uh, um, and so, so Le Tremont was a very much present for me when I, was, when I was writing that as well. So these are various coordinating points. Right, and when you just write after this passage, when you say, an age which no longer loves poetry has betrayed itself, there are not two kinds of poetry, there's only one, Jacobin and unyielding. Um, how does that resonate with not only your work but as, as a writer, but also your activism? Yeah. So, that was a difficult passage to write, uh, and the reason why is, I think that we are, many of us, maybe almost all of us, trained to be thoughtful pluralists, especially if you're a teacher, you know, 
you, you would never say to your student, oh, well, there's only one good kind of poetry and you're not writing it, I'm sorry. I, I bet there is a teacher who said that. I can imagine who? Robert Duncan? Barrett Watton? <laughs> um, saying that? Uh, um, but of course, one, one, that can't be one's position as a, as a teacher, as a, as, a, as a friend. And yet, I think that my sense of political struggle I had become very exhausted with the endless, like, well, you have your way, I have my way. Um, there's many ways. We all, it's all, we're all secretly involved in a joint effort to change the world. And I've come to believe in my life, we're not. Some people are actually pretty comfortable with the way the world is, and they'd like to maybe tune this and change this a little bit, but they're not particularly committed to annihilation, as, as the poem says, to negation in the, in the purest sense. And at, when I came to understand that, I stopped feeling compelled to say, like, yeah, there's just many different ways. I, I don't think there's a right kind of poetry, but I think that there is a commitment to, abs to the absolute and to negation, or there's not. Uh, and that, for me, is the, is the, divide, is the dividing line. Um, and, you know, you don't win any popularity contest by saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how how does that um, how does that work in relation to political action? Um, how does that articulate? Um, and if there's only one kind of poetry, uh, how do you uh, judge? Which is the right kind? Yeah. I, don't, I don't think I have a good answer to this question, to be honest, which is to say, um, I have two things that are contradictory, and I think it's important to, birth, to hold on to both of them. So what I don't have, as I said before, is a belief that there is, that everyone's trying, there's many right ways, and so on. I think that um, there are political courses of militancy that I'm persuaded by, and then many, many courses that I'm not persuaded by. However, the only thing that saves me from being the worst kind of ideologue, I'm probably like a mid-level ideologue, what saves me from being the worst ideologue is that I'm quite aware that I've been wrong over and over again. Like, the thing I think now is not what I thought when I was 30. So, either I'm wrong now or I was wrong then. So, you know, one thing for sure, I'm wrong at least half the time. Uh, and. Because of that, I sort of hold that, you know, as that's either the good angel or the bad angel, but that angel's on my shoulder when I'm also saying, oh, um, I'm committed to a revolution. If it, I think it probably will have to be violent. I, don't, I no longer believe, as I did when I was 20, in um, a, a beautiful, peaceful, mindful, idealistic overcoming. I think there's going to be a violent struggle whether we like it or not. Right. Uh, I think that um, all you can do is choose a side. Mm. You can't say, oh, violence, or something like that. Mm. So, um, so I don't have, I think, a single political program, but I have a sense of, of, the, of a necessary threshold of political intensity or, or fidelity, that's sort of a bad you word, I'm not sure I want it, but of intensity, militancy, fidelity, um, that is necessary. Right. Uh, and that's, so that's, and then, and then an awareness that in 10 years I could look back and think like, wow, you idiot. <laughs> um, you were talking about negativity and a form of commitment to negativity in, in your work. Um, and yet there is also, um, in various poems, not only the one that we just quoted, uh, The Gilded Age, uh, but a commitment to aesthetics and the pleasure of aesthetics. I was wondering how you reconcile them. Is, is, if there is such a, you know, a consignment or a reconciliation between both, um, and to some extent I was wondering if this tension between you know, the, the, the pleasures of the aesthetic or the interest or belief uh, or faith in the aesthetic and the commitment to negativity of that tension uh, overlapped with um, the, 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 
the tension between poetry and criticism? Mm, mm, that's a complicated question. I'm going to do the annoying thing, which is, before I answer it, insist on a slight change. So I would always choose negation over negativity. Right. It's funny, this is always a debate around Bartleby the Scriven, and I would prefer not to. Like, he's the figure of negativity. He just withdraws, he won't. Whereas negation is more active in that Hegelian sense, enters into struggle. And so me, as much as I like Bartleby, I'm more negation than negativity. Uh, so, to sort of now say back your very insightful question about, so is the dynamic between negation with an underlying political logic to it and aesthetics, um, a pleasure and aesthetics around that, is that relationship similar to the poetry criticism relationship? And now that I've had a chance to say it back out loud, the answer is no. Um, I agree that those four things would make it useful. You do one of those charts and there's quadrants and you arrange them and figure out the dynamics and maybe you make a Gregnesian square and who knows. Uh, but, uh, and so those things are in play. But I think that some of my favorite poetry is charged with negation. You know, I, you, I, I think of the, you know, the, the, the passage from Baraka that I put up. Uh, on, this, on the screen the other night to talk from black people because it's a very difficult poem in various, in various ways. I didn't put up the part that's openly anti-Semitic. Um, uh, but there's passages in that poem, other parts in Barack, I think, that are true, true negation, not much aesthetic pleasure unless one learns to take aesthetic pleasure in negation. At the same time, there's criticism that I think is deeply aesthetically pleasurable. In fact, that may be in the end all post-structuralism has to claim for itself is it's the deep pleasure of reading the best passages of Derrida or Deleuze or something like this. Um, so I'm not quite sure I would line things up in that way, but I think for me the real use of your question is that it gets me to understand something I hadn't understood before, which is that in my trying to negotiate the relationship between poetry and criticism or poetry and theory, I was secretly negotiating the relationship between politics and aesthetic. That is true. The negotiation, I think, is a bit harder to lay out than you've laid it out, but I hadn't realized that's what I've been doing, so you've taught me something uh, already. Um, you were saying a minute ago that um, a lot of the American poets or poets that you read were um, negative poets or poets who wrote, uh, whose work involved negation. Um, it, it's, is that, is there a tradition of, would you consider there's a tradition of negation in, in, in poetry? I want there to be. I want there to be, I want to be able to make an anthology that's sort of done, you know, the, the book of negation. Um, and I could imagine starting to put it together, but could I get to 50 poets? I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's a, it's a real tradition. And it would be a question of, we'd start to debate it would be good nature. But we start to debate what counts as negation. So Kevin Davies. Kevin Davies is a contemporary poet who, for me, if we talk about poets who've done their main writing since 2000, that's what I'll call a contemporary for the moment, for me, Kevin Davies is one of the two or three greatest, greatest for me, especially the book The Golden Age of Paraphernalia. That, for me, is a book so great, it's like early Bob Dylan. I, can, can't, I can't even look at it because it makes me feel bad about my own work. <laughs> um, it's so magnificent and so capacious, and so, but so is that negation? Uh, um, I think readers would have to judge for themselves. I would probably argue yes, but it's kind of negation by proliferation. It's not the negation of um, up against the wall, motherfucker, right, of, of Baraka. It's a negation by a kind of proliferation, an endless ironic scorn, um, uh, and an, an insistence that the form that the information of the world is given to us can be just broken down and reassembled and overcome. So we'd have to make a case, you know, and so then you go, is that negation? Here's my four-page essay arguing yes. So I'm not sure there's a tradition. I think I could make one, but that might be sheer force, you know, I'm not sure it's true. Mm. And how would you define negation, actually? Um, um, Ooh. Well, that's the hardest question. Right? I, I, hope, I hope it's not getting harder than this or I'm going to fail this <laughs> quiz. Uh, um, uh, I would define negation as um, wanting actively to unmake the basic arrangements of the world 
around us. So um, negation, one thing it would do is overcome the form content disting distinction, not so much in aesthetics, but socially. There's these things which are social forms or political forms, and then they have their own content. So for me, this betrays my tilt toward Marxism, I think, but for me, something like the political in the conventional sense is largely a form. It's a set of relations. It's almost aesthetic. So people talk about neoliberalism all the time. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually quite a weak category. It's a formal category. It, it, it suggests some relationships between some parts. And so what's the content? The content of neoliberalism is uh, with the collapse of industrial economies and employment in the Western world since the 60s or 70s and the various strategies people have tried to uh, restore that and fix them, um, the immiseration of people, their expulsion from work, the increase in surplus population, and so on. That's going to be the content. Negation does not negate the form. Negation negates the content and the form vanishes with it. Mm -hmm. um, and in that it reveals the unity of form and content. But the unity of form and content is only truly revealed when you get to the level of content. Mm -hmm. You can't negate. And this is the mistake that the weekly political poets make. They think you can negate the content of the world by negating the form. So that idea like avant-garde poetry that challenges how we understand language and the relations there, and, thus, and in so doing it challenges commodity relations and so on. I'm caricaturing the language poetry argument, which is in many ways sophisticated. Uh, but that idea is exactly that at the, at the level of uh, social form, we can interrupt that, transform that, and it will transform content. I just don't think that. I think that's just a mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for me, negation goes to the content and takes form with it. Right, right. Um, that um, idea about content, I mean, I read O'Hara as a poet who criticizes content a lot of the time, and yet he calls himself a materialist. Um, but there, and, and Ashbury to that extent, so whether you think of um, the Tennis Court Oath or uh, the Vermont Notebook, they're all about everything that has to do with content in those books is, is um, deadly or morbid. Um, and I mean, it's content as, as something that gets talked about, not so much the content of the book itself. Um, but to go back to what you were saying um, in terms of. Um, form and the negation of form and the, uh, the hints that you were making at the language poets. I was wondering if this is what you were uh, talking about in the poem Years of Analysis for a Day of Synthesis uh, when you say, and you could hear the human poets sing economy of language while paring the poem down to an object-oriented ontology subhead Parmenides or Parmenides? Parmenides? Parmenides. Parmenides among the moderns, but surely we are forgiven for hardening our straps against the marketplace. Or maybe I got it wrong, but... Well, th this is a great problem. That, that poem is... I don't want to speak ill of the poem. I'm, I'm proud of that poem. But it truly is um, a compressed set of references so dense, I'm not sure I can reconstruct them anymore. I, that, that poem took me a very long time, hence the title. Um, it took me a very long time to write. Um, much of the language is taken from other places and transformed. Uh, so th there's a lot from the main sources were Dante and Wallace Stevens and some, mm -hmm. some other ones. Um, language of finance is, as well. Right. So the, in, when I refer to the, the object-oriented ontology refers to a sort of theoretical philosophical movement of the last 10 years, this in a way gets back to the point you raised about O'Hara's materialism. I'm going to go in a little circle here, but I promise I'll come back. So, O'Hara, I think when he says that, it's legitimate. He doesn't mean he's a historical materialist in the way that, I don't know, Marx is, or Stalin thinks he is, or something like this. But he's interested in the stuff of the world, in objects, in material. So, uh, we'd say probably a Lucretian materialist in some sense, like, mm -hmm. interested in the matter of the world. And for him, the matter of the world is mostly um, commodities. Right. Um, in a way that I think is beautiful, right? He recognizes the commodities are the molecules from which reality is built in mm -hmm. New York in the 1950s, and he's correct. Like, it's an insight. Uh, and so, I think a bad version of that returns with the, with the new materialisms, if, which is a sort of meta-category of philosophy of this millennium, 
um, the new materialisms, including object-oriented ontology and speculative realism and so-called thing theory and so on. So in part, I was responding to that sort of bad version of this materialism of oh, oh, what really matters is the objects of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking of that in relation to poets and not the language poets, but of maybe the Creeley lineage um, for whom a real reduction to some minimal, uh, absolutely sort of um, hard, I don't mean that in a bad way, I'm trying to think of sort of the right word, like dense, um, recalcitrant truth. Of course, that's the power of Creeley, right? It's, the power of Creeley is not the neat little syntactical tricks he did with the very short lines and maneuvers they allowed, those are nice, but that he was, he's got, he, he got the truth over and over again. Um, uh, um, but that desire to sort of reduce yourself down to, to that as a defense against the overwhelming welter of the stuff and the flux of the world, that's a poetic tradition that, um, that I also don't feel too in contact with, that sort of minimalism or something mm -hmm. like that. Minimalism is different from like the anti-aesthetic, right? Mm -hmm. It's minimalism is just this idea of paring down and purifying, purifying, uh, and I don't feel much much connection to that tradition. So I think I was trying to respond to that in that moment, but also trying to be understanding that um, yeah, the world just keeps coming at you. It keeps coming at you with seductions, and it keeps coming at you with attacks, and the desire to make everything everything you make, including your poems, to be small and armored and protected, I really understand. Mm. But also, in the middle of a five-page poem that's one sentence, mm. I had to articulate why I might think that's worth doing, too. Right, yeah. right. And it's, it's actually interesting because at the beginning of this poem, um, you say, real city, I'm always arriving elsewhere, having traversed the threshold of the century. Echoes of Whitman or, or Whitman and Elliot, right? Unreal City yeah, from Elliot. Yeah, um, Elliot, and still trapped in the approximations of the lyric or the post lyric, uh, or the lyric with Chinese characteristics. Um, th th this business of the lyric, which uh, comes back over and over again in your poems. Uh, there's another poem where you talk about Sappho. Um, you also talk um, uh, of the end game of the lyric. Um, how would you define the lyric uh, and how would you define it in relation to your work and also uh, in relation to the history of American poetry because it's certainly been under attack uh, quite a great deal and um, anyway, so that would be... Yeah, that seems like another one of those big poetic debates I didn't really mean to intervene in too much. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's harder to get away from the lyric than we think. You know, the, so the lyric, for better or for worse, has been the name we've used for the most common forms of poetry for the last couple of hundred years. Virginia Jackson, Jenny Jackson, as everyone, everyone knows her as, um, has, I think, a pretty good argument about lyricization. I can't follow it all the way, but um, the argument that the lyric doesn't have an internal formal coherence to it, uh, and keeps being reinterpreted historically in a process she calls lyricization, and she's in some ways always locked in a debate with Jonathan Culler, who thinks the lyric is an actual, um, has intrinsic characteristics that you can name or understand in a subtle way. Um, these are two subtle thinkers. And I think I'm more on the Jenny Jackson side, that it's a historical process of renegotiating. And I think in part because of that, the lyric is a little harder to overcome than we think it is. Mm -hmm. But it's not endlessly fluid, right? It's along its, its course of development, certain associations have glommed onto it, romanticism most of all. Mm -hmm. um, and probably like a lot, romanticism and then like confessional, like the confessional era. These associations, which now people feel very um, uncertain about or hostile to, and so, for example, the project of overcoming the romant romantic subjectivity of the lyric mm -hmm. has been an avowed project of American poetry since at least the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, you know, endlessly, explicitly conceptual poetry's project is they're going to show you, they're really going to show you this time that your illusions of having a, um, 
a subjective I who's original and authentic is a is a is boring and a delusion and a mistake and I think it's harder to get over than that. Like I just don't I don't feel compelled to have an opinion about whether there's such a thing as originality or not. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that a lot of the things, a lot of the poems people wrote that they thought were overcoming the lyric, you know, you look back at Bob Perlman's poetry and, mm -hmm. and it's beautiful lyric poetry. Mm -hmm. I think in fact now we read My Life by Lynn and which is laid out as prose, um, but you sit down in a room and read it out loud and it sounds like beautiful lyric poetry, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, I, I, I just want to be aware that it seems quite likely that everyone who's sure that they've really conquered the lyric this time and shown those lyric people what's what, in 20 years we're going to look back at them and be like, I don't know, it sounds pretty. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's really what I wanted to say is, is well, there's, so there's two things you can do. You can try to overcome the lyric or you can try to re-inscribe it and say, well, it just it means something different now than it did in mm. uh, 1794. And mm. I actually don't, I don't, I don't have a strong feeling about which of those things to do. I just don't think we should be too confident about doing away with traditions. So again, like, here's the simplest, crudest formulation, and of course that's all you'll ever get from me in the end, is I'm going to work until I come up with the crudest formulation. The lyric, whatever it once was, whatever its roots, whatever its deep truth, much like democracy, became one of the forms, the expressive forms of liberal capitalism. Mm. And I don't think we're going to do away with it mm. as a form without doing away with the content. Mm. Uh, and so I'll just get back to that claim. If people really want to get rid of the lyric, go for it. Destroy capitalism. Mm. Which actually brings me to my next question, um, which um, I was going to say, assuming that the lyric is the expression in verse of a personal voice of a subject, if I add to this your definition that you just gave, I was wondering whether it would be possible or something um, to be wished for uh, to have a communist lyric, I mean, to blend lyricism and communism. That's and the question I wish I knew the answer to, <laughs> right? I mean, so there's, I mean, there's a tradition of thought around um, even defining what communism is, you know, famously, Right, Marx never writes a book called Communism. He writes a book called Capital. Um, he doesn't tell us what communism will be like. There's no forecast. Frederick Jameson has this great uh, essay called The Island in the Trench, I think. Um, it's originally a review of a Louis Merrin book, um, Utopie d'Espace, uh, if I recall correctly. I hope I'm not botching this, but that's my memory. In which he argues, well, you can think the break. You can think the break between the land and the, the like the land that we're on, obviously standing for contemporary liberal democratic capitalism, and the island that we wish to get to, uh, you can think the trench between them. That's the break. But you can't think the island itself. You reify it, you end up then with just making the form in advance that you're then compelled to supply content for. And what matters is that you make a break decisive enough so that there's the potential on the island without saying in advance we know what the island is like. Same argument about poetry, right? If I were to say like, oh, here's what a communist lyric is. Now many people have tried to do this. There's a real lively tradition of people trying to figure out poetry as if, right? This is the great formulation that Dorna uses it, many people use it. Um, so what would it be? Poetry, the aesthetic in general, is this is, this is the claim of the mid-20th century. This is a vital, vital historical question, I think. Um, that poetry is a space where it's possible to think the world as if. It's possible not to be totally dominated by the market, by the labor process. It's a space that's semi-autonomous is the really important, unclear category that Adorno de develops. Um, but it's at least semi-autonomous. Uh, and with that semi-autonomy, it can th think, imagine a different world, and imagine like, or at least it can hold that space open. And that's the dividing line. So does the aesthetic hold the space open for that future content, or does it try to formalize um, 
what that future content might be in advance. I'm more receptive to the idea of holding a space open, which is probably the better side of a door now. Like, you can't imagine a communist lyric, but you can hold a space open where it, the walls haven't completely closed in, there still feels like invention itself is possible, and invention within the context of, of communism. I think that was easier to imagine in 1950 than it is now. The idea that you could be at a distance from the market, at a distance from domination, that there was some space still preserved from it. Well, this is a French tradition. You look at Baudelaire, right? The striking thing about Baudelaire is the content is new. The content is this world coming into being. You can, you can look at that poem, you know, La Signe, and, and it's, it's, it's about the um, internalizing into Paris of these, of these new former banlieues that are not going to be part of the city itself. The laws change in 1860, and he's talking about these new apartment blocks going up, and it's a specific narration of that moment, the newest things. But the form is actually quite rigid. The, the, um, it's, it's the, the meter and the form is from the aristocratic era. So that's, that negotiation is beautiful, right? The new content pouring into this old form. Uh, and that's, for me, the sort of interesting problem. I don't think you can just make the new form. Mm -hmm. um, I think the new content comes along and it appears first in the old form and then breaks its shackles. Uh, and so when does the new form of you know, the post-revolutionary world break through from that aristocratic formal straitjacket? Maybe Rimbaud, right? And, and uh, so I think the new content comes in first into an old form. So I am not confident about developing a new form in advance. Mm -hmm. I was asking this question, um, you know, bearing in mind uh, the, um, the, 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 the end of the first part of the fire summer, where, you know, um, you said you end by saying, if lunch poems were the poetry of the future, it, it would all be like, I communized this, I communized that, um, which I thought was, was uh, you know, very funny, uh, and yet very serious at the same time. Um, but thinking about form and, and content, uh, so so then you, it brings to mind you know the um, uh, Creeley slash Olson you know form is but but the extension of content. So that's something that you would agree with. I've gone back and forth on this in my life. I don't want to. I don't want to claim that like, oh, I, I understood this was a major puzzle and I came to a decision at some point and now I know. I've really gone back and forth because people have made the opposite claim. Right. Uh, and form is never more than an extension of content. I think that's initially true. The problem is once forms get made, they become given. So right, first mm -hmm. you have content, I accept that. Mm -hmm. People make, f make forms um, out of that content, but then that form becomes a given and people start filling it up. Mm -hmm. And they might start filling it up with new content, this is what I'm talking about with Baudelaire. Um, so maybe it's more of a daisy chain or something mm -hmm. like this, where uh, form arrives first as an extension of content, uh, but then it's there and new content can start to come into it. And it can be very useful for, uh, you know, new content shows up and one of the great problems is no one can even recognize what it is. Like, if new content just came floating in through the window, we were looking at it, we'd be like, what is that? A cloud? A butterfly? It's like that moment in Mrs. Dalloway where they're looking up at the sky writing and everyone sees different worlds. We wouldn't know what it is. And so one of the reasons I think it's useful to have these old forms, which can allow new content is, is then we can start to rec it gives us a way to start to see what it is and under understand it. So I maybe think form content, form content, form content, form content, mm -hmm. rather than there just always being content and it gives up the appropriate form for it and then we move on. Right. Which actually brings me to where, I mean, we've already talked about this word, but I think it's, it seems to be quite important in your work, which is transformation. Um, and how do you conceive of transformation uh, in relation to, I mean, it can be either poetic transformation or social transformation or political transformation. How does that, how would you define transformation? So that's this question about scale, I think. Uh, so, again, a sort of seemingly irrelevant story to get myself moving. I remember doing, sort of, 
oh, 15 years ago probably, conducting a poll online with a bunch of my friends saying like, oh, choose a favorite pop song lyric. Um, many people will know I'm, I, I remain a, a, a terrible fan of top 40 pop music. And so choose a pop song lyric. Um, and I let everyone choose. I asked like 50 people or so. I just let everyone choose their like, Now, um, what does that say about you? Like, because, it, of course, pop songs are all great, but they really only have two or three themes, right? If you, you look at, you, you, if you take just the top 40 songs over the course of decades and write down the themes, you just, it's worse than Vladimir Probe. There's, there's, al there's almost none, right? But the love is always, always a big theme. Um, love gain, love lost, etc. And self-transformation. That's the other theme. Over and over again, these songs are, are about how, um, in often the most banal and cliched ways, sometimes quite moving ways, about how um, my life is going to be really different. I've come to an understanding. I'm going to transform. I'm going to change. Flying is always the image for it. Um, you know, I'm going to spread my wings and fly. And that's a, the trans. So, I think not to be like now be mean to the lyric, which I sort of defended before, but that idea of personal transformation happening, desired, its impossibility reflected upon, is a major thematic for the lyric. Many different ways, people have different accounts, but that's a huge uh, historical feature. Uh, now for me, and I think this is implicit in your question, or maybe ex it was explicit in your question, I'm interested in a different scale. I'm interested in, in total social transformation, the transformation uh, where the total social relation uh, um, changes. Uh, so, I think, for me, I'm really interested in negotiating at those two levels, but not too easily. Like, I don't want to just say all these visions of personal transformation are just sublated, sublimated desires for a large, like, secretly everyone wants communism, but they talk about it as if they want to be a different person tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That would be, I think, an easy, cheerful thing to think. I'm not mm -hmm. sure I really think that, but uh, I'm interested in transformation at a systemic level, but the important thing to say is, right, that trans personal transformation often seems quite willed, which is to say someone says, like, when, when I'm going to make myself change, I'm going to do a thing, I'm going to change myself, sometimes it fails, um, uh, whereas I don't think you get to will great social transformation, it comes during great struggles and antagonisms, but it also comes with these forces that are far beyond us. So I'm working on a book of poetry, criticism is maybe the right term, or um, an account of poetry in the United States since the 1970s, and it's called The Transformation Problem. The title might change. Um, of course, there's a poem by that, sure. by that, by that title, um, not really related, but there's a poem by that title in the, the book. The Transformation Problem is actually, it turns out, the name for a very specific economic question about how to transform values into prices. I'm interested in that. I'm not the economist to solve that problem, uh, but it seemed like a useful form formulation to talk about poetry since the 70s, where there has been a transformation. Obviously, it's not the transformation I want, which is the end of capitalism, but it is a transformation. It's a transformation of the decline of the US empire, which. Mm -hmm for a long time, for a century, successfully organized the entire world around it. It still sort of does, but it's a bit of a mess, it's chaos, there's mm -hmm. obvious decline, the empire's unraveling, and poetry is played out against that scene, against that great transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, transformation, the first thing you say is, it's happening. Maybe not the one we want, but mm -hmm. I believe, and here it might be the crazy, bad historical claim that I'll be embarrassed about at some point in the future, uh, but Actually, you know, the, the, there's the, it's often ascribed to the Chinese, but I'm not sure this is right. That, 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 that proverb or that curse made you live in interesting times. I think we live in interesting times, Olivia. Like, I think we live in a time of major transformation that Frank O'Hara didn't. Now, I love Frank O'Hara's poetry, but he did not live during a, this, a, a period of major global transformation, and we do. And I think poetry confronts this or it doesn't. Mm. Uh, and so that's the thing I'm trying to think about. So, yeah, when I mean transformation, I want to negotiate between those scales from the individual to the system, but my heart is with the system. Mm. Boy, I want that to be my t-shirt. My heart is with the system. <laughs> <laughs> That's <a> great. <laughs> How does the poetry confront that transformation? I mean, in practical 
terms, how, how, how does one do it? Well, I think lots of ways. So, you know, whatever, I, I talked uh, a little while about, go about my disagreements with the theoretical apparatus of uh, the language writers. Right. But, so theoretical disagreements, big deal. They took very seriously this problem. I don't think they formulated it in exactly the same way, mm. but uh, in related ways, they appear at that pivotal moment. You know, often this transformation is dated if one has to give it a date to 1973. Right. Uh, and this is exactly the moment when their language writers are starting to uh, get their shit together and become a thing. I think this is no coincidence. And one of their senses is, I think, um, this is just a fraction, right? But one of one of the senses is uh, this world's changing; it's transforming. There will be different reading protocols, and we and we need to write into these different reading protocols. For one thing, um, the idea that there sort of is a naturalistic clear language is probably in like an Anglo-centric, right? Mm. The lingua franca of the world. Ironically, it's not been Franca at all. It's been it's been Eng it's been English for quite some time. Mm. That won't be true at some point, right? Mm. Now that I don't think that means everyone's going to start writing in, uh, you know, some version of Chinese or Urdu or I don't. People in the Anglo sphere will still write in English, but they'll be writing into a world where it can no longer be assumed that. People in other countries will speak that language, that that's the natural direction of translation. And we will all have to rethink our relationship to the global language system uh, once the hegemony of the English language declines, which of it? So uh, I think that that's one of you know one of the ways that poetry changes is it starts to be agitated around the decline of the hegemony of the English language. Mm -hmm. That's only one of the ways to, to, to think about it. I think that um, the antagonism that you also see, you see in the 70s between experimental poetry and po so-called, and poetry associated with the new social movements, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is to say that the poetry is sort of a new revolutionary subject, and there can be a, a poetry that articulates the subject position. Uh, that confrontation also arises at exactly the beginning of this of this great transformation of the, of the decline of U.S. hegemony and maybe the rise of others. We don't we don't really know that yet. Uh, what's interesting to me about the present moment is that antagonism has returned quite openly. Right? It's not exactly a repeat of the poetry wars, but there's very much the same version of sort of experimental or avant-gardist super formalist camp, which contemporarily is conceptual poetry, mm -hmm. and then a newly charged political poetry. It's not quite the same as the new social movement poetry of the 70s, but you've still seen various versions of it, including poetry that me and my friends are interested in. Right. Uh, so it's interesting to me, what are the two great crises, like global economic crises of our lifetimes? Well, you're very young, of my lifetime. 73, 2008. And what happens is pretty much the exact same drama in both those. So why is that the case? Why is it the case in these moments of global crisis, which is not just global, but specifically about the role of the United States within the global system, uh, and whether it can sustain the global system, why does that particular drama of um, a largely raced and classed experimental project against uh, often identitarian, but not always explicitly political project. Why does that keep coming up in those moments? I don't have the answer to that question, right. but when I do, my book will be done. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and um, you mentioned conceptual poetry, which um, I'm no expert of, but it seems to me that conceptual poetry um, plays with um, the art world, which is capital loaded yeah. in a way that is that would not allow the conceptual poets to be completely you know distance from that from yeah but no one's just there I mean sure right. like like I mean I don't have art patrons I don't get invited to galleries I don't get invited to um, the big art festivals like some conceptual poets do but 
I have a job at a university, it pays right. me pretty well, I buy things from Amazon online, come on. I don't really think, like, for me, my, um, if, I, if I'm looking for a sort of a line of criticism regarding conceptual poetry and its problems, I'm not sure I could really pull off without being quite hypocritical, the like, oh, they're so implicated in capitalism and me, huh, of course I am. Uh, that said, so, I mean, I think about it in a slightly different way. If I want to think about what conceptualism is as a structure, I would say it's a project to disarticulate the category of the avant-garde from radical politics. In the 20th century, of course, the avant-garde was inseparable from radical politics. Often it was the same people um, who were working on avant-garde aesthetics and fighting in revolutions, and the fundamental relationship between, we talked about this a bit before, a vision of transforming the world was, you know, that was a lived experience related to visions of transforming aesthetics. Uh, and that's no longer the case, right? There's, there is no, as much as we might like it, there's no grand revolutionary movement, there's no communist horizon, uh, at least there's no near horizon, there's no uh, sense of right now, I think we're mostly of a sense of like chaos, drift, terrifying eruptions of uh, super populist, maybe fascist uh, mm -hmm. events. Mm -hmm. But there's no, there's no lived revolutionary politics happening. And so it makes sense the avant garde would not be able to, to uh, have that attachment. But for me, that might mean the avant garde should vanish since that's its history, it's its attachment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's attachment to entanglement with lived uh, ambitions for social transformation. And conceptual poetry, if I wanted to um, cast the sternest light possible on it, just seems to me openly the product of having an apolitical avant-garde. Um, and the funny thing is the poetry world is so small that, that individual agents, individual players can have a big impact. So you might say, Oh, the project of an apolitical avant-garde, that's just Marjorie Proloff's project. Mm -hmm. and of course it is, it always has been. Uh, and that's always been her desire, and um, I think it's nice that that dream came true for her, <laughs> um, you know, while, while, while she was still with us. And of course I adore her as a person and I hate her politics. Uh, and I, I, I guess it's nice for her that that dream of an apolitical avant-garde was realized with conceptual poetry, mm -hmm. which of course she helped realize. Uh, so there's an entanglement there. Um, and that would be my concern with conceptual poetry, right? And of course, I think any number of perfectly reasonable people would say not all conceptual poetry. And they'd be right. I'm, I'm generalizing. I really mean brand name conceptual poetry. I mean Kenneth Goldsmith and Vanessa Place and people like this. Uh, but I think there's actually a, a younger generation of conceptual poets, many of whom, interesting, were these people's students, passed through Pennsylvania, work with Kenneth, work with right. Charles, and so on. Um, but actually have much more interesting politics. You know, I think of Trisha Lowe or Joseph right. Kaplan or people like this. Um, uh, Steve Soltansky, various other people. Uh, so I don't want to generalize too much, but right. that's my sense of the limits of conceptual poetry. Right. Um, in relation to capitalism, um, there's one issue that I'm interested in, that, uh, not only as a scholar but also as, as, as a citizen which is the issue of coherence mm -hmm. you know if, if you're critical um, as we are of the capitalist system how can you be self-coherent and is, is that is, is coherence something that is, is it an issue for you or is it just part is it, is it just part of the uh, the, the, the process of it's an issue, right? I mean, we all we all want the easy out of saying like, uh, "Do I contradict myself?" Very well, then I contradict right. myself. Done. I've admitted it. It's cool. On the other hand, here I think that there's real limits to the accusation of hypocrisy, right? Which is to say, um, you know, let's imagine someone wants to be an aggressive anti-capitalist. Mm. Um, uh, you know, dream, dreams of communism. They live in the same world that you or I live in. What can we say about that world? Well, one of the things we can say about that world is that water supplies are being uh, degraded by environmental destruction and privatized by corporations. As a result, very simple fact, much harder to get water for free publicly than it once was. Uh, 
Uh, so somewhat, this person we're imagining, one day they finish work, because it turns out they have to work to stay alive. They finish work, they're very thirsty. Let's so say they work during construction, building houses. They finish work, they're very thirsty, there's no water available, they're going to have to spend money, it's a euro no matter what they do. They decide to buy Coca-Cola, as you and I and Franco Heron know, Coca-Cola is delicious. But they're thirsty, they have to get something. Water, Coca-Cola, it's a euro either way. They throw down their euro, they get the Coca-Cola, the Orangina, the water, it doesn't matter. Let's say it's Coca-Cola, and they drink it. It's delicious. Two years later, they write their poem about how they hate capitalism. And then some fucking conceptual poet shows up and says, We saw you drinking that Coca-Cola. <laughs> you were on a street corner on, uh, on uh, Boulevard Beaumarchais. Uh, <laughs> and we saw you drinking the Coca-Cola. You're no better than us. Get off your high horse. But that's just a scam. People are trapped in the world. They have to buy things. There's no non-complicity. That's the fantasy. And moreover, if you achieved it, like that perfect ascetic, like, I knitted my own shirt from my cat's fur. <laughs> and um, then it's miserable. Everyone says, why would anyone want to do that? You should just, like, you should just get with the program and buy Coca-Cola. So it's a trap, right? It's a trap. So I think there's real limits to that question of coherence. Um, at the same time, we, that shouldn't be permission for us to delude ourselves. We have to understand that we struggle from within, not from without. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the second you think you're truly without, mm -hmm. you're lost. Right. And so, coming in additions is a way of struggling from within, right? I mean, I hope so. Is, what, how, so, how is the, I mean, you did mention it before, but how is the project born and what is its where are you now yeah. with coming editions? Yeah. Um, how I was born and where we are now, the funny thing is the press has only been around for two years now, two mm -hmm. and a half years, but it's already in quite a different place in ways that concern me, to be honest. So, as I mentioned, Occupy Oakland is quite a large phenomenon, and it brought together a lot of people who write poetry, some of whom would identify as poets, not all of them. Um, poetry scholars, people who are interested in poetry, with a lot of political militants who maybe in their lives hadn't been that interested in poetry. But then you find out you're hanging out in Occupy Oakland and you're putting up tents or you're working in the kitchen or you're doing various things and you find out this person you really like, who you've been engaged in political struggle with, like they're a poet. You get interested, you start to listen to each other more open-mindedly, like, hey, it's not so, this kind of interesting. And then suddenly, suddenly we have these poetry readings with a hundred people, but it's not just that there were a hundred people, it's that 70 of them would be anarchists who weren't poets, because you know, most poetry readings are other poets, it's your mm -hmm. friends, it's nice mm -hmm. enough, it's a small community, but suddenly they were much bigger and filled with people who were not there because they were also poets, but because they were interested in what their comrades did with their lives, and poetry was one of the things they did. This is a compelling moment for all of us, uh, and we wanted to make a press coming out of this moment which published poetry, but wasn't necessarily for poets. It was for people of a certain political persuasion, which we identify as anti-capitalist and anti-state. So not just communists, but anarchists. Anyone who thinks capitalism has to go, uh, central state domination has to go. Um, we wanted to publish poetry that might be interesting to those people, whether or not they were poetry people. Mm. Uh, and that moment seemed really possible in 2013. 2012. But things move quickly. Uh, that tide has ebbed a bit. There's still hangovers from it, but I think it's less true now than it was then. As a result, we're a little concerned. I think we're back to selling mostly to people who are scholars of poetry, fans of poetry, writers of poetry. That moment where casual, sort of um, militants, thought that poetry might be part of their lives too. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to be able to hold on to that moment. I hope we can. But so, so I think this is a matter of concern for, for all of us. But our commitment is clear. And if it turns out that, um, that that audience wanes or disaggregates for a while before coming back together sometime down the road, we'll stop having the press. Uh, it, it, that's what will happen. Um, 
right now we're fine. We actually did very well our first year. We're starting to publish more translations. Sad thing about the United States, I don't think only the United States, is that it's very hard to sell poetry in translation. So we're publishing these labors of love, these translations. Uh, they're not going to be terribly popular. The question of how we sustain ourselves right. will come up. We've been putting in a lot of our own money, but we probably can't do that forever. So don't know what the future is, but well, you know, we believe in our vision. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Joshua.